right, five minutes after nine o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. I think you're going to like this next interview um, and certainly the book that is associated with the interview. Our interview is with Jean-Pierre Isbouts. I think I said his name correctly. We'll find out in a second. He is an historian. He's an award-winning filmmaker. He um, is the man responsible for the movie or the film Walt, the man behind the myth, narrated by Dick Van Dyke, Operation Valkyrie, and the Mona Lisa myth, narrated by Morgan Freeman. He's a doctoral professor at Fielding Graduate University in Santa Barbara, California. He's a best-selling author. When I tell you the title of his book, you're definitely going to want to turn up the the volume and and hear this one. Uh, Ten Prayers That Changed the World, Extraordinary Stories of Faith That Shaped the Course of History. Jean-Pierre Isbouts, good morning, sir. How did I do on your name, first of all? Uh, Larry, you did it perfectly, thanks. (laughs) Oh, good. The S at the end, do you say the S or is it silent? No, no, it's Isbouts, yeah. It's okay. a strange name, yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> we all have names, right? If you, ha- if you had a common name, you, you know, you'd, there might be two of you on the Hollywood Walk of Fame one day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being on the air with us today. This is an interesting topic. How did this become uh, a focus for you, enough, enough to uh, write a book about it? Well, the, um, uh, I've written several books for National Geographic, and... Uh, um, you know, much to our surprise, uh, two of them uh, became bestsellers. Uh, in, in, in the footsteps of Jesus, became a bestseller in in about six weeks. I don't know who was more surprised, my editor or myself. So it it it, it really mm-hmm. shows that there is a, a tremendous interest uh, in the intersection of biblical material, faith material, and and science and history. And that's my approach. I'm, you know, I'm not a pastor. I'm a historian. I'm, yeah, a, I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated by the way that archaeology and science can really open up the world of uh, of the Bible uh, and of antiquity for us. And so we we got to talk, and we and and uh, she said, well, why can't we? My editor said, why can't we extend this into our own experience, into prayer? Is there a way to connect history with? the way we pray and perhaps have an impact on the course of mankind and that's how we came up with are there prayers spiritual moments that have affected us in the in the course of of the past in the course of mankind and and uh, it was a very intriguing question. It spent a year investigating it. Yeah, but, uh, it, is, it is intriguing, yeah. yeah. I, I've often thought that the one thing that all religions must agree on, apparently, is the fact that there are seven days in a week. Because if you think of that, it's probably an arbitrary number based on the story in the Bible that the God made the world in seven days, or made the universe in seven days, right? That's absolutely true. And um, uh, I'm working on a book right now, which is coming um, out at the end of this year. I'll, I'll have to come back to your show uh, mm-hmm. about uh, archaeology of the Bible. And one of the things that I try to demonstrate there is that much of the biblical material, particularly Genesis, uh, originated in uh, Mesopotamia, which is today Iraq. And much of that material was actually inspired by local literature, local myths, so the idea of, of the world being created in seven days. We also find that in many Babylonian and Mesopotamian epics, and that, I think that's so wonderful to see those parallels and see how much the Genesis material and the biblical material originated in a very specific frame and time. When we look at the writings of Shakespeare, or just or just the writings of any old writings, we, we uh, come across sometimes words that today have a totally different definition. Uh, one that came to uh, our attention just not too long ago was the word nice. Nice used to mean foolish. So just using that as an example, well, I don't know if that occurs if, in any prayers, but I mean, did you have to retranslate a prayer that might be really old so that it makes sense to us today in order to, to do this? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, one, one example it clearly is the, uh, is the Lord's Prayer, the, the Our Father. Now, you know, all, as Christians, we all pray this on Sunday. You know, whatever denomination you belong to, we all know the Lord's Prayer, which actually is a wonderful thing. That's the one thing that binds us together. But the symbology, the, the hidden meaning behind those words is often lost to us. And so uh, the second chapter, the prayer to Abba, the prayer to the Father, uh, is delves into that and says, okay, now what is Jesus really trying to say with things like, give us today our daily bread, or forgive us our trespasses? What does that really mean? And so I try to relate that to the culture of first century Galilee, the 
the way people lived then. It was a very rural environment, struggle for daily life. And, and when you do that, the whole prayer starts to gain an entirely new meaning. Does, does the, okay, do, do we have any prayers from before Noah? And, and if we do, were they just memorized? Or like, because the, according to the Bible, everybody's gone except for Noah and his family. So they must have remembered everything and wrote it all down. Yes, indeed. Well, it's interesting. The reason why I start with the story of Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac and, and Abraham's plea to save his son is because the word prayer appears for the very first time in Hebrew Scripture in the Old Testament in the story of Abraham. So with Abraham, for Abraham is the first character who actually uses prayer. And uh, I think that's such, a, such an important thing, because we know that prayer originated, again, in Mesopotamia. You know, the earliest gods all had to do something with agriculture, rainfall, you know, fertility, because that's where agriculture emerged. That's where man started to cultivate his food for the very first time. And of course, everything was dependent on a successful harvest, so that's how the idea of religion emerged, by prayer to ask the gods to intervene and secure a good harvest. And so it's very interesting that, that we see the Bible placing the origins of our faith in that environment and to basically have Mesopotamia as the place where the idea of a, of a single God, of one God, emerges, because it's very much, again, in the context of the history and the economy and the political system of that time. And that is really, um, re really mind-boggling to me, because different cultures, they all pray to God. I mean, just because the Christians have a uh, Jesus doesn't mean he's not part of God, and that always boggles my mind as to why we all can't get along, because we technically are praying to the same God. Absolutely, and, and uh, that's so wonderful with uh, the, the Gandhi's prayer for peace, and I basically close the book with that, that and Mother Teresa, because Gandhi makes a very important point. He says, look, you know, we're all just branches on the same tree, and whether you call God Rama in the Hindu format, or, or Allah uh, in Islam, or Yahweh in Judaism, or God in, in, in Christianity, Abba in Christianity, it's just... You know, God created all of us. <laughs> it doesn't say in Genesis, now I'm going to create just these people in Arabia or just these. Yeah, right, he right. created all of us. It, it <clears throat> says it so clearly in Genesis. So I agree with you. I don't understand why we try to sort of, sort of isolate our group as the only one who understands who God is. Nobody has the copyright on God. The, uh, the the religions you named all can be traced back to Abraham. Um, there are others, obviously, the Buddhist religion doesn't trace back to Abraham. The the Native American uh, re religions, if you call them that, their faiths, their they yeah. don't. Well, are there are there uh, obviously the prayers you chose? It seems like they're all Judeo-Christian prayers. Am I right about that? Yes, we wanted to include. Uh one uh, Islamic prayer, because the, the, there are beautiful prayers in all of these religions. But the important thing is we wanted to find a prayer that had a tangible impact. Yeah, that's what I want to know about. Kind. Yeah, yeah. and so we, we wanted to pursue the prayer of Maimonides, which is a very famous prayer used by physicians. Maimonides himself was a Jewish physician at the court uh, of the Pasha in, in Cairo, which we thought was a wonderful story of, of interfaith tolerance. And then our research determined that the prayer actually is a 17th century construct. It didn't really, wasn't really written by Maimonides at all. Oh, really? So we had to <laughs> abandon it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, so the research sometimes made you go in a different direction than you thought you'd be going. Absolutely. And here's another example. You know, George Washington's prayer at Valley Forge. Everybody knows that prayer. Oh, yes, George Washington, you know, at a very deep moment, difficult moment in the battle against the British, sank into the snow at Valley Forge and prayed to God for intercession and for victory. It's a wonderful story. We all know the paintings, you know, and we, it turned out that, that it's probably not a true story. It's probably a pious myth. But then we found that George Washington did write a prayer when he ended his career as before he became president he abdicated his role as commander-in-chief and he sent a beautiful prayer to the states 
to ask them to live in harmony with one another. And so that is the prayer that we decided to write about. Wow. Let's take a little break. This is fascinating stuff. Jean-Pierre Isbouts is on the phone. He's a filmmaker, and, and this is an interesting book, so I'm going to ask him if he's going to, if he's considering making a documentary yes. or something based on this study. Uh, the book is called 10 Prayers That Changed the World. I really want to focus on how you can determine that a prayer changed the world. This is interesting. Uh, can't wait till we come back, and we'll do that in just a bit. This is The Source, WOCA Ocala. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. There's a high risk for rip currents at the beaches for the rest of the week. Wednesday, it'll be breezy with sunshine and some clouds, high 80 to 84. Wednesday night, patchy clouds, low 59 to 67. Breezy on Thursday, sunshine will mix with some clouds, get to a high of 80 to 86. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Steve Travis. Tick-tock, the days fly by, and refined tax season is upon us once again. Not to worry, though. With a reputable CPA firm on your side, you can rest assured that all of your needs will be handled in a professional and thorough manner. Robson, Scribner, and Stewart is just that firm. They're there for their clients year-round, not just during tax season, to handle your needs and answer any questions you may encounter. At Robson, Scribner, and Stewart, there is no client too small or too large. Their expertise ranges from the single individual to the largest of corporations. Get your return prepared by a professional who will use their years of experience to ensure that your tax returns outcome will leave you in the best possible position. Call them today at 694-4184. Robson, Scribner, and Stewart. They're there for you today. Again, that number is 694-4184. Time is of the essence, so don't delay. 694-4184. Spring is bursting out all over at Bob Wines Camellia Gardens, and Bob starts it all with this fabulous deal on azaleas. Prize dwarf ever-blooming azaleas, regularly selling for $6.99, now just $2.99 while this special truckload lasts. Also, a huge selection of geraniums, an outstanding array of colors, just 99 cents each. And of course, one of the most popular items of the spring, Bob Wines' famous heirloom camellias, thousands to choose from, regularly $19.99, now just $14.99, and plenty of large your ones available. Don't wait. Get your share of the springtime flowering bargains today at Bob Wines Camellia Gardens, away from all the traffic on Southeast 38th Street, Ocala, just a mile east of US 441. Now with special spring store hours, daily till 4, closed on Sundays. Remember, homegrown, locally owned, in the same spot since 1952. Ocala Business Leaders Incorporated is a group of independent local firms providing a wide range of quality goods and services. Each firm strives to maintain the highest level of professional integrity and 100% customer satisfaction. When you're looking for goods and services, call a member of the Ocala Business Leaders and we are confident you will be pleased with the results. If you are interested in becoming a member of the Ocala Business Leaders, join us at the Ocala Elks Lodge, 25th Avenue in Ocala, any Wednesday at 7 a.m. and enjoy a breakfast on us. For more information, call 804-3700. Ocala's Got Talent. Happening in May, but if you want to get in on the running, you need to apply. The dates are March 12th, 19th, and 26th from 10 to 6 p.m. each day. And the location is at Mojo's on Southwest 17th Street. Do you have what it takes to shine and stand out in what you do? Well, there's only one first place winner for Ocala's Got Talent, and it could be you. Audition fee is just $25, and spectator fee is 5 This helps the Heart of Florida Youth Ranch. Questions call 352-595-7100. All right, 19 minutes after 9 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. I was just thinking there you know, during the break, an interesting thought about, about prayer. If you, if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, you could say, my silent prayer changed my world. Nobody ever heard my prayer, but I did pray to God, and after I did, I got the job of my dreams, or, or, or my baby was healed, or, you know, things like that. You know, you hear stuff about that all the time. But in order to write it from a historical point of view, the prayers couldn't possibly have been silent. They had to have been written down or, or said aloud, right? And other people would have had to have been responding, reacting to the words in those prayers. Uh, Jean-Pierre Isbats is on the phone. He's got me thinking about this kind of stuff because he wrote the book, 10 Prayers That Changed the World, Extraordinary Stories of Faith That Shaped the Course of History. Jean-Pierre, um, thank you for waiting through the break. Uh, where are you calling from, by the way? 
I'm calling from Santa Monica. It's uh, the sun is rising. It's a beautiful day. I love Santa Monica. I'm going back one day, Robin. I'm going to go back to oh, Santa. Oh, nice. So, te- so am I right about what I just said? That okay, we could we could all argue on a spiritual level that silent prayers even change the world. But I mean, you looked at it from a historical point of view. That's right, and and it's a bit of a radical way of looking at things. I I admit, but I, I did wanted to show that. You know, history is not just shaped by kings and queens and leaders and individuals that are set far above our station. Uh, it, 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 it can also be done by very ordinary men and women who are prompted, who are inspired to do extraordinary things. And when you look at the word inspire, it actually comes back from the, it's based on the Latin verb inspirare, which means to breathe into something, into someone. So I I see this as divine whispers. I see this that Hmm. some people have received divine whispers that prompt them to do things that they didn't think they were capable of. Uh, Here's an example. Um, Joan of Arc, a simple peasant girl. You know, she should be playing with her dolls. She's she's age 13, never held a sword in her life. And she she hears voices that tell her to go and raise the siege of the city of Orléans. And, uh, and she does. She, she goes to the prince, she goes to the French court. She convinces the prince to give her, a 13-year-old girl, an army, <laughs> and she moves on and defeats the English forces. Now, to me, that's, that's an incredible story. I mean, that is pretty, like that's pretty incredible, yeah. yeah. Uh, out, of, out of Hollywood, right? But it really happened. Now, there is a really an instance where a divine whisper uh, can really change the world. So, in that case, the prayer comes from God to human as opposed to the other way around. Am I right? I see it as a cycle. I see it as a, as a basically a go between God and yourself. Plato uh, once wrote, and this is 300 years before, before Christ, that we all carry within us a spark of the divine. And, and I see that as a bit of a reception, like a, like a, imagine like an antenna. Uh, so we have that in ourselves. We just need to find the right bandwidth to connect with that spark and thus create a very, very intimate uh, relationship with God. Many people do that. Other people don't think it's important in their lives. But we all have some yearning for that type of spirituality. And when that spiritual connection is made, then very wonderful things can happen. Well, I think once we master the art of language then we need language. Um, but but prior to that in our lives, maybe when we're before we're one year old or whatever, uh, we we probably have this communion with God just naturally. You know what I mean? And and then the, as as language becomes a part of who we are, we we lean on it more for information and inspiration. Absolutely, and that's actually the subject of the book that I wrote last year, uh, Jesus, an Illustrated Life, also by National Geographic. What I try to do there is is not to critique the stories of the Gospels from a historical point of view. I did that in, in Footsteps of Jesus. What I try to do is really immerse myself and, and explain to the reader what it was like to live in the first century where there was no written language, there was no internet, there was no television, there was no media. That is, I always tell my students, that is the most difficult challenge for us to understand the Gospels, is to imagine what it was like to live in those days, when the only form of information transfer was the spoken word. And when you do that, when you imagine where there's absolutely nothing around you other than the real world, then you can imagine that uh, spirituality, that supernatural phenomena begin to play a much bigger role than in our modern times when everything is, you know, visualized for us through the modern media and technology. It is, that's the connection you have to make. And then a whole new world will open itself up for you. And the prayers seem to be discovered um, not in obvious places. You talk about the prayer of St. Francis. That's right. It's a great story. You know, here's a Here's a, a, a beautiful little prayer. We don't quite know who wrote it. We, we think it's a, a simple parish priest in France in the early part of the 20th century. And this prayer winds up being published in a little parish bulletin of a, of a local church. And then it begins to grow and grow and grow. Uh, it's first at the World War I breaks out, so people are really yearning for spirituality. This prayer explodes. It's published by the Pope. Uh, World War II, it continues to grow. The U.S. Senate publishes it. And, and along the way, 
somebody decides to print it on a little prayer card. You know, this is the time uh, when these prayer cards became very, very popular. And what you would do is you would print a prayer on the one side, and on the other side you would, you know, print a picture of a of a saint that you happen to like. Well, the person who printed that prayer was happened to be a a Franciscan. So what he does is he puts a picture there of, of St. Francis. Well, before long, everybody starts to say, this is the prayer of St. Francis. And that's how it continues uh. in our modern day, uh, the, the, the funeral <laughs> of, of Princess Diana. People read the prayer of St. Francis. Several rock stars have put it to music. And it all starts with that tiny little prayer that this uh, unknown priest wrote in the early 20th century. The, uh, the the prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, in the book you call it, and you already mentioned this, the prayer to Abba, is that, am I yes. saying it right? Yes. Uh, and the, the actual prayer that you print is not the one that we're familiar with as far as word for word the way it might be recited in the church. And That's I, true. Be, and yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to ask you about one part of it, because I've always wondered about one part of the Lord's Prayer. And, see, the way I learned it was, the, and this part specifically, um, uh, I don't know, <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it will be in heaven, or as it is in heaven, something like that, right? That, yeah. right? Yeah. And I've yeah. often thought, okay, I wonder if that is supposed to mean that we as people are supposed to take this imperfect place and do everything in our power to make it perfect so that it is like heaven. Or is it saying that one of these days... It's not going to be our control, but God's going to come back, and we're not going to need locksmiths anymore because everybody's going to be honest. I've well, <laughs> well, it's true. It's, you know that is one of the fundamental questions of modern Christology. Is the uh, the, the, the what I call the the manifesto of uh, the heavenly kingdom or the kingdom of God that Jesus talks about? You know, you cannot separate the ministry of Jesus from that that concept of the kingdom of God, and for him, I think. It was the ultimate expression of what he wanted to achieve. Now, let me tell you, as, as historians, there are conferences, there are symposia on what that really means. Mm. Is it a heavenly kingdom, or is it some sort of a utopia that we want to establish on earth itself? And I tend to believe, and, and some people do agree with me on that, is that the kingdom of God concept that we talk about in the Lord's Prayer is something on earth, where we want to create a society built on social compassion, on justice, and on faith in God. That is a reflection of the heavenly kingdom to come. That's how I interpret it. It's going to be hard to do. <laughs> it's going to be hard to do. Are you, Certainly I, in this electoral <laughs> cycle, yes. <laughs> is, is it hard to, to put this kind of subject into a film? Uh, no, it's actually uh, wonderful to do, and I have been in a very fortunate position as a historian, as a scholar, to have been given the means to sometimes put my books into film. It is a, it's a great blessing to be able to do that. Uh, many of my colleagues uh, have not had that opportunity. But I've sort of always, from the very beginning, even when I was in graduate school, back a long time ago, uh, started to create films based uh, side by side with my scholarly work. And, and so um, it, is, it is really wonderful to translate a written book, a written argument, into a mediated argument, into a documentary that sort of very patiently lays out the, uh, the things you want to say mm -hmm. in a very compelling way. And, uh, you know, the problem is, is the fundraising. You know, my last film, based on my book, uh, The Mona Lisa Myth, uh, we took, it took us two years to raise the funding. Oh, so yeah, for, that's the problem with the films. There's a lot of money involved, yeah. It's, it's so much money, because for that film, we needed to shoot in location in Italy. We needed 70 actors in costume, a uh, Renaissance costume. Jean-Pierre, we're out of time, but I want to make sure that the listeners know how to get the book. First of all, I have a copy, Ten Prayers That Changed the World. Call me if you want the copy that was sent to us. The rest of us have to go buy it. How do we do that? Do you have a website? Yes, I have a website. Of course, it's available in your local bookstore. It's published by Random House and National Geographic or Amazon.com. And my website is jpisbounce.org. And uh, we'll have that on our website. Let me give the book away. Good morning. You've got the book. Who's this? It's Lauren. Thank L you. Amen. Lauren, you've got it. Thank you for calling in. Uh, Jean-Pierre, thank you. That was wonderful. I love that interview. We'll be right back. Thank you.
Fox News Radio, I'm Lillian Wu. Big wins last night for the Republican frontrunner, Michigan, Mississippi, and Hawaii, going to Donald Trump, who told Fox and Friends... One of the biggest stories in all of the political world is the millions of additional people that are coming and voting in the Republican primaries. Ted Cruz winning Idaho, Democrat Hillary Clinton winning Mississippi, but narrowly losing Michigan to Bernie Sanders. A Baltimore school police officer has been 